Hi, I'm Brian Hanrahan, the Biotech Program Director here at Starfish Medical. I've been involved with clinical diagnostic and regenerative medicine product development for over 20 years and was very excited to join the Starfish team uh, in July last year. Starfish is a medical device design and development partner with manufacturing capabilities. And over the last two years, we've broadened our area of application to support medical device development in biotechnology and regenerative medicine. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about developing medical devices for regenerative medicine applications. And before I do too much of that, I wanted to provide a little bit more around uh, defining the term regenerative medicine and also a bit of background and, and the current state of the industry. Then I'd like to look at uh, medical device development for regenerative medicine applications. And finally, just uh, explore a little bit some thoughts around near patient processing and the potential for something like this to be part of the answers to the cost of goods challenges that face uh, autologous therapies. So the definition of regenerative medicine is fairly, or the term is very broad, um, generally meaning the process of replacing, engineering or regenerating human cells, tissues, organs to restore or establish normal function. The interesting aspect of uh, regenerative medicine is most of these therapies have at their core living cells. And this is very different to conventional drugs and therapeutics uh, such as biologics where a large batch of product is made and you know there's much more controls in place the ability to fully characterize the product um, and obviously uh, these are not live cells and the complexities of handling live cells have been at the center of some of the key challenges to bring the industry to where it is today uh, an interesting perspective on regenerative medicine from the FDA and, and their definition is it's a field with great promise that includes a variety of innovative products, including cell therapies, tissue engineered products, human cell and tissue products, as well as combination products. And so in that you can get a flavour of the complexity of providing something uh, like a, a therapy uh, that's part of the regenerative medicine industry. And there's really a continuum from very simple uh, therapies through to very complex therapies. At the simple end of the spectrum is what we would call the original cell therapy, which is a blood transfusion. Clearly today, that process of receiving a blood transfusion is very straightforward. But clearly at the start, this was really uh, a lot was uh, understood or needed to be understood before these therapies became um, very simple and straightforward as they are today. At the other end of the spectrum, there are now tissue products that include scaffolds and, and cells and other biomaterials to enable um, more complex, complex therapies to be delivered. And clearly there's a range in between. Some of the factors that influence the complexity of the therapies include where we've uh, obtained our cells from. And so you'll hear the term an autologous therapy or an allogeneic therapy. And by autologous, we mean uh, really a patient specific or essentially when your cells have been collected and then uh, delivered back to you. Allogeneic therapies on the other hand are really where we're looking for more of a universal donor. So many patients could be treated from one batch of cell product. And that model, or the allogeneic model, is very much the approach that the pharmaceutical industry is sort of invested in and feel that that is the, that is the mechanism and way to reduce the current costs. At this point in time, the most of the products that have, have received approval are more, more autologous in nature than, than allogeneic. The other, some of the other factors that influence this complexity are around how uh, or what cell modifications are, are going to be made to produce the, the functionality that the cells need. Um, and so when we think of that, it's, it's really things like gene modification where we're looking to do transfection to put in a, uh, a missing or a misfunctioning gene. And clearly that's 
that's not a simple process. Uh, the need for other materials, as I said, in terms of tissue engineering, so scaffolds and biomaterials, um, also increase the complexity of, of the product. Um, finally, the, the ability to deliver or administer the product is still one of those challenges where medical devices come into play. And the important element here is that we need to get the right number of potent, viable cells to the right place. The industry uh, has also been classified a little differently by the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, who are an industry body based in, in Washington. And you know, just a little bit of a capture of, from their annual report at the end of 2018 to give a sense of where the industry is at. Um, you know, based on total global financing at the end of 2018, the industry was worth more than $13 billion. And had grown and more than doubled, sorry, in the last four years. Not only from a financial perspective, but also from a clinical trial perspective. The number of clinical trials at the end of 2018 was over a thousand. And again, in the last, that had doubled in the last five years. So really there's a, a huge amount of, of interest and work being undertaken in the, uh, in the regenerative medicine industry. If we look at the clinical trials profiles and what, what's actually been undertaken at this point in time, of those thousand clinical trials, more than 60 or almost 60% of those were focused on oncology. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, CAR T therapies or chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapies as really the leading light of, uh, of therapies that are driving the, uh, the industry forward. And that's very much in the oncology space. So that's, that's a big part of the uh, area of, in, of uh, focus for the industry at the moment. But there are many other areas, including cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, central nervous system, ophthalmology, etc., where there are a whole range of products being developed. The more of the or oncology uh, therapies have look to be uh, autologous in nature, and more of these other therapies are tending to be allogeneic. Um, and that's really one of those things that's potentially been uh, holding some of them back in a way. As I mentioned, uh, CAR T therapies, and the interesting part of that is that at the end of 2017, two CAR T therapies gained approval in the US, one from Novartis and one from Kite Gilead both treating uh, a subset of haematological cancers. And the amazing thing about it is that, you know, these prove that we can cure cancer. Um, the challenging aspect to that was that uh, when they were approved, the price for these therapies is roughly 450,000 US dollars. And that brings with it, you know, um, I guess many questions in terms of how do we how do we pay for these therapies and, and justify that cost? And so that area of focus is on reimbursement is very much one that's, uh, that the healthcare systems around the world are grappling with at the moment. Medical devices in the regenerative medicine or cell and advanced therapy industry is not an area that's been widely talked about. Um, and that's really because much of the focus of the industry in recent years has been very much on the manufacturing process and how to try and reduce costs. But medical devices and the term medical device does mean different things to different people. Ultimately, in the context of regenerative medicine, when we talk about a medical device, it's really when we connect to the patient. And therefore, the manufacturing process, which at the moment doesn't really connect to the patient, is not generally a medical device. The medical devices are, by and large, more around cell collection and uh, product delivery or administration. And these range from fairly complex systems, such as an apheresis machine, uh, to more some invasive techniques, such as a bone marrow um, aspirate or biopsy when we're collecting cells. And at the 
delivery side, there is also a whole range of different medical devices involved in providing a, a therapy. These can be quite simple in terms of an infusion or a syringe and needle, um, but when we get to more complex solutions such as tissue engineering, then this will be much more complex delivery solution. So medical devices in the regenerative medicine space have evolved uh, as they have really because the industry itself had to start initially looking at understanding the science and cell biology and really understanding the mechanism of action of these therapies. And the tools that were used have essentially been manual open laboratory processes. And to bring the industry forward, these processes have essentially been transferred into GMP or good manufacturing facilities to enable these products to be produced and enable them to be delivered to patients. The um, interesting part of undertaking that process is that we've developed solutions around cryopreservation to preserve cells and, and maintain their integrity. So a lot of work's been done in that space. What it has enabled is some flexibility around the manufacturing process, but it also has some unintended consequences. Namely that every time we do a thaw cycle with cryopreserved product, we do lose quite a number of cells. As a consequence, we need to make more cells in the manufacturing process. So that introduces more time and, uh, and really it's, it's one of those things that would uh, make it more difficult to look at near patient processing solutions. Whether it's a medical device or it's a manufacturing process in a GMP facility, there are two different approaches to ensuring and in managing safety and quality of cell-based products. In developing medical devices, whether for regenerative medicine or medical devices in general, human factors is a very important component of the design process. And for regenerative medicine, there's a little different field of, of expertise, but the same principles apply. It's really about making sure we understand who the user is and how they will need to use that device. So we think of cell collection devices and the device shown here is not uh, one that was designed by Starfish Medical, but it's essentially a fairly complex uh, apheresis system that needs to be loaded with a disposable set for the collection process. So understanding the apheresis operator or nurse and how they need to use this system is an important input into the design. Similarly, as we think of the delivery of any cell-based product, uh, if this requires a more detailed surgical procedure, then the need to understand the tools and the processes that the surgeon will use will drive design decisions around that medical device. And that's one or an additional aspect in cell-based therapies is that when we come to deliver these products, we have to ensure that we maintain potency and viability of these products. So we don't want to cause shear or cause aggregation of cells as they're delivered. Another factor with this is that all surgical procedures, uh, operators and, and users will be, hand, uh, will be wearing gloves. So the, the ability to use touch screens, to handle and hold things, to grip, to open packages are all very important inputs into, again, the design. And as therapies such as tissue engineered constructs become more complex, then medical devices will be required to safely administer them. The product development life cycle for a regenerative medicine product is extremely complex and multifaceted. And therefore, the design considerations need to take a systems approach. Upstream and downstream factors can significantly impact what the design might be. And that's one good example there is, is the use or is the cryopreserved cell-based product delivered to a surgical area for delivery and ensuring that that product can be safely and easily um, thawed, potentially washed 
and then delivered. So the, um, you know, and again, what surgical tools may be required uh, is another important aspect of uh, delivering these cell-based products. I'd like to now talk a little bit about near patient processing and the potential for this approach to impact the cost of goods for autologous therapies in particular. The idea of near patient processing is one where this could be implemented potentially on some less complex cell-based therapies. And what it would enable is a medical device to collect cell material to select the specific cells that are required, perform a reasonably simple modification, such as transfection, and then return the cells to the patient. Um, this essentially means that all of this, all of what was in a GMP manufacturing facility could be done within a, a medical device near the patient. This has a lot of appeal because the, the ability or the costs associated with running a GMP facility a really significant part of the overall cost of providing one of these therapies today. So this isn't something that will be applicable to all cell-based therapies, but certainly um, CAR-T therapies would be one that potentially would benefit from a near patient medical device system. Now, I see this as very much analogous to what uh, has taken place in the diagnostics industry with the evolution of point of care diagnostics. So if we go back 20 years, uh, all diagnostics essentially were performed in a laboratory. Um, blood was collected, it's sent to the laboratory. The diagnostic test is performed and the result is then delivered. And in the last 20 years, we've seen the evolution of technology that allows more rapid diagnostic tests using much smaller sample volumes and to be those to be generated very quickly. And, and this is, as I say, very much the way it could play out for near patient processing in cell-based therapies. It's a, very much one of those areas that will uh, continue to be explored as this cost challenge continues to uh, be part of the the, the challenges associated with providing cell-based therapies. So to summarise, um, the regenerative medicine industry is at an extremely exciting time in its evolution, as, and as many more of these complex therapies make their way to the clinic, the need for medical devices will continue to increase. When you require a medical device to support the delivery of your therapy, then seek assistance from an experienced medical design and development partner, for me with cell and advanced therapies. The cost of goods challenge for autologous therapies will continue to drive innovation and near patient processing solutions will be part of that answer in the not too distant future. I'd like to thank you for listening and if you'd like to contact me, please contact info at starfishmedical.com my name is Brian Hanran and thanks for listening.